Hello everyone and welcome to the free lecture series organized by our online education initiative Learn CAX. Our online lecture series is one of the steps towards reaching our goal of being a part of every engineer's life. Before we start, let me congratulate you on selecting Aerodynamics course and thank you for choosing us to share our knowledge on aerodynamics with you. Initially, when we designed this course, we thought of starting our first lecture with basic concepts of aerodynamics. That lecture probably would have covered viscosity of fluid, boundary layers, flow separation, Bernoulli's equation, etc. But that's the way a normal textbook or a classroom lecture would start. And if that conventional way of learning is successful, you would not have chosen this online course to learn this subject. So we decided not to start this course with basics of aerodynamics. We redesigned the course syllabus and came up with this. Your curious mind. This is the first video lecture of the course Aerodynamics. Curiosity is a very critical property of every engineer. In our day-to-day -day life, we witness many situations without knowing why they happen or what governs them. Curiosity would make you ask these questions to yourselves. It would make you to think and come up with some answers. And the objective of this lecture is to make your curious mind to think. This lecture will highlight some of the very interesting real-life applications of aerodynamics. Now, let's start our interesting journey of knowing more about aerodynamics. For every engineering subject, we have some preconceived ideas or misconceptions about the subject itself or application of that subject. And aerodynamics is not an exception. You may believe this or not, but most of you might have a misconception about aerodynamics. Let's do a small exercise to test your understanding. Just close your eyes for a moment and listen to this word, aerodynamics. Now, open your eyes. What was the first thing that came to your mind? Did you see a lot of flying aircrafts? If yes, then it means you have a preconceived idea about the subject that aerodynamics is something to do with aircrafts or air vehicles. But is that really true? We will definitely answer this question at the end of this lecture. Now we will look at some real life scenarios where aerodynamics is applied. Traveling places has become a part of our daily life. Our mode of transport might vary, but we cannot avoid traveling. So let's start our discussion with road vehicles, which is a major mode of transport for us. If we talk about road vehicles with four or more than four wheels, it all started with this. The 1894 two-seater Benz Velo with a 1.5 HP engine. This is the first mass-produced and compact car in the world. And now we have a variety of passenger vehicles and commercial vehicles. We have cars, vans and buses which are mainly designed to transport passengers. And we have trucks designed to transport goods and cargo. If you notice, the shape and size of each vehicle differs from one another. This variation in body design is not only between different categories of road vehicle, but also within each category. If we take today's road vehicle, I see a major difference between their exterior body design. So I always wonder 
whether this design change came because they are made by different manufacturers or are there some general factors that decide the exterior body design of a vehicle? Mainly, the shape and size of a vehicle gets modified based on purpose of transport, seating capacity, distance of travel. It also depends on passenger comfort, luxury, look and feel. But even cars with the same seating capacity and comfort vary in design. To understand the reason behind this, it would be a better idea to look back in time and find out where the present day's car body design came from. Let's turn our clock back in time. And just for an example, I have selected cars made by BMW. Here is an exhibition of some of the BMW cars starting from 1940s till the year 2000. Every decade has seen some changes in the body design, although they are made by the same manufacturer. Let's have a look at the evolution of design with time. This shows the representative cars made by BMW from 1951 till the year 2000. Now, if you compare the shape of the car made in 1972 and the shape of the car made in the year 2000, it's quite different. The overall change in body shape and size is clearly visible in the side view of the cars. But understanding the exact change in design needs a much closer look at the vehicle. Let us pick some of the cars from different timelines and analyze their design profile in detail. But before that, let's find out which are the components that define the external shape of the car. These include bonnet or hood, windshield, rear glass, roof, trunk, etc. Now, we will move back to our car body design analysis. Let's focus on prominent or visible design changes of four critical components of the car's exterior body. Just to explain or understand, I have drawn two imaginary axes, that is, vertical and horizontal axes. Let's start with front bonnet. Now, when I draw the angle made by the bonnet with the imaginary horizontal axis, I do see a progressive increase in the angle with decade. Now, when it comes to the windshield and the angle it made between the vertical axis, we do see a progressive increase with timeline. Now, let's look at the back side of the car. Again, we will use the imaginary axis, vertical and horizontal axis. When we draw the angle made by the rear glass with the vertical axis, we see an increase in angle. Also, you can see the change in length and angle of deck or truck of the cars. So, to summarize, we have seen the prominent design changes done to four major exterior body components of the car over the years. Now, the question that comes to my mind is, what is the reason behind these changes? Are these changes done just to change the look and feel of the vehicle? Or is there something more? Does the maximum speed achieved by the car have some hand in it? Or is it the passenger carrying capacity that has made this change in shape and size of the vehicle? Or is it the fuel consumption that has brought these design changes? I won't discuss the answer for this now, but I hope you will be in a position to answer these questions at the end of this course. Before moving ahead, let's do a simple experiment on fuel consumption. 
you might not be able to do this experiment at home due to lack of resources. But you can always do this in the best experimental setup in the world, that is, your mind. What I want you to do is to look around and randomly pick two cars. I suggest you to pick cars manufactured by different manufacturers. I have selected these two cars. Are these cars going to have same fuel consumption? No. We know each vehicle has different level of fuel consumption per distance travelled. But have you ever wondered why is it so? Maybe they are fitted with different engines. Ok, let's make it more simple. Let me select an engine and fix both the cars with the same engine. Now both cars have same engine. Again we will ask the same question. Are they going to consume the same amount of fuel? Maybe you will say no because I haven't told you about their driving conditions. Again let me make a simple assumption. Both the cars are subjected to the same driving conditions. And this means both the cars are carrying same number of passengers with same weight and both the cars are driving at the same speed on the same road and the weather conditions or wind speed. Do you think we will get the same fuel consumption? The answer is no. So even after maintaining the driving conditions and the engine, the fuel consumptions of both the cars would differ. The only possible difference is the shape and size of the vehicle. Does the exterior body design have an impact on fuel consumption? Well, I am not going to answer this, but I will give you a hint. When the car starts moving, it starts facing a resistance to move from the air. And this air resistance differs with shape and size of the cars. Just think over it. Now we will see another mode of transportation, which is rail transportation. Trains are used to transport both passengers and cargo through rail tracks. A locomotive or an engine is used to provide motive power for the train. Locomotives may generate their power from fuel or they may take power from an outside source of electricity. Based on this energy source, they are classified as steam locomotive, diesel locomotive and electric locomotive. While the diesel locomotives generate their power from diesel, the electric locomotives are supplied power by the overhead wires. In the recent decades, a method of using magnets to propel the vehicle called maglev is evolving. But our focus here is on high speed rails, widely known as bullet trains, whose operating speed is more than 250 kilometers per hour. One of the challenging part in operating the trains at very high speeds above 250 kilometers per hour is the high energy consumption. It was observed that when the operating speed is increased, the energy consumed by the train gets high. Like cars, trains also face air resistance while moving. But as the operating speed is very high, the trains have to face very high resistance from air. And to overcome this resistance, they need to spend more energy. We cannot compromise on the speed. But we can definitely change the exterior design of the trains and see if this would reduce the energy consumption. Again, we will look back in time and analyze the design changes made in the exterior body component of the bullet trains. We will mainly focus on three exterior components of the train. First, we will start with the nose design. 
then the gap between two cars and then the bogey skirts. Here is the changes in exterior body design of trains from 1980s, 1990s and till present. The nose of the train plays an important role in reducing the air resistance. It also decides the path of air interaction with the bogey region. We can see a visible change in the node design. The gap between intercars creates a cavity in the body which creates energy consuming vortices and therefore should be avoided. Attempt to reduce this cavity is clearly visible with time. Although bogey skirts are mainly used to reduce aeroacoustic emission, it also helps in reducing the air resistance. All these design changes are trying to reduce the air resistance. But are they really helping us to save energy? Yes. The changes in design has brought down the energy consumption to a greater level. If you compare the energy consumed by the train design in 1980, it is much more and it is reduced to a greater level with the exterior design changes. Also, I would like to mention these exterior design changes also contributed in achieving operating speeds of up to 380 km per hour. Till now, we discussed on reducing energy consumption or saving energy. Now, we will talk about generating energy. More specifically, generating electrical energy from wind. Wind is nothing but air in motion. Due to sun's uneven heating of the earth's surface, a temperature difference arises and thus a density difference is created. This difference drives the air to move and causes wind. During ancient times, wind energy was used to propel sailboats. Centuries ago, simple windmills were built to convert wind energy into useful rotational energy for mechanical purposes like pumping water and grinding grains. It was at the end of 19th century Humans started using wind energy to generate electricity that powers industries and homes. In 1888, Professor Charles F. Brush built a wind turbine of 50 meter rotor diameter with 144 rotor blades which produced 12 kilowatts of power. The world's first megawatt wind turbine was built in 1941. It had two blades and was capable of producing 1.25 megawatt of energy. And now, modern day wind turbine has three blades and is capable of producing power up to 5 megawatts. So, the question is, how these modern day wind turbines manage to produce more energy out of wind? Does the change in blade design do the trick? Or is it the number of blades? Or something else? To answer this question, we need to understand the working of wind turbines first. Today's wind turbines are much more complicated machines than the old windmills, but the working principle remains the same. Both capture the wind's energy. Here is how it works. Wind passes around both sides of the blade. The blade is designed to cause uneven pressure, that is, higher pressure on one side and lower pressure on the other side. The uneven pressure causes the blade to spin around the center of the turbine. The blades are attached to a shaft that turns at a very low RPM, which is not fast enough to generate electricity. So, the low speed shaft spins a series of gears. 
which increase the rotation to a scale of 1 is to 100. For example, if the low speed shaft turns at 18 rpm, then the gears increase the rotation up to 1800 rpm. And at that speed, the generator can produce a lot of electricity. So, to summarize, the wind's kinetic energy is first converted into mechanical energy through rotation of blades and then into electricity with the help of generator. Coming back to the question on how modern day turbines extract more energy from wind. The first noticeable thing is the blade profile or the shape. Typically, the design of the blade should be such that it creates more uneven pressure on both sides of it, even with less wind speed. A classical wind turbine should be able to rotate even in a gentle breeze. In order to make sure the wind turbines are operated at maximum possible efficiency, we have to also take into account the unpredictable wind conditions. The wind conditions are different at different geographical locations. And at the same geographical locations, the wind conditions vary from time to time. Or simply, the wind speed and direction are not constant and the variation is uneven. So, we need to have a mechanism which measures the wind condition and directs the orientation of the wind turbine. To do that, we have a vane at the backside that measures the wind condition. These measurements are then passed to a control system which directs the turbine orientation to capture maximum wind energy. Here is a comparison of power output with the tower height and rotor diameter. The amount of wind or kinetic energy available to generate power is directly proportional to rotor surface area or swept area which increases with the rotor diameter or the blade length. But with increase in blade length, deflection of blade tip due to axial wind force also increases. This puts a limit on blade length. Now, why are wind turbines so tall? The higher you go, the windier it is. Yes, wind speed increases with height. More wind means more electricity. So, it is desired to have tower height as high as possible. But the difficulty in structural design puts a limit on the tower height. An Aircon E126, a large wind turbine with a rotor diameter of 126 meters and a tower height of 135 meters, which can generate up to 7.58 megawatts of power is the one with the highest nameplate capacity, that is, power generation under ideal conditions. This is often limited by weather conditions. So, it is very clear that every interaction of turbine blades with air has an impact on the power output. So, knowing the behavior of air around the blades helps in improving the performance of wind turbines. Understanding wind motion is not only necessary to save energy and produce energy efficiently, but also to ensure safety from natural disasters. You are watching the dramatic collapse of Tacoma Narrows Bridge that happened in 1940. The reported possible causes for this collapse are aerodynamic instability by self-induced vibrations in the structure, eddy formations that might be periodic in nature, 
and random effects of turbulence that is the random fluctuations in velocity and direction of the wind. In the recent decades many bridges are designed as landmark structures with challenging architectural and structural features. Technological developments allow bridges to be constructed longer than previously attempted. The limitations on the span of bridges are being pushed continuously. To make it possible, the structures needs a detailed winch study. Construction companies with the help of research facilities develop a dedicated section model rig which allows investigation of vortex induced oscillations at high Reynolds numbers. This will also allow them simultaneous measurements of the bridge deck motion and the time varying surface pressures around the deck due to the wind load. With increasing number of skyscrapers around the world, engineers and architects face the challenge of decreasing the impact of wind on structures and their built environment. The questions they have in front of them are how the building should be placed? What are the design life wind loads? Wind tunnel testing of scaled models and CFD simulations are used to predict both static and dynamic wind pressure loads. The testing is conducted under simulated site-specific climatic conditions. For buildings constructed in hilly or mountainous terrain, it is important to establish the flow conditions in order to have a correct representation of the wind in the design. Enough of saving energy. Now, let's shift the gears and discuss about the topic of everybody's interest. Sports. Surprised with this topic in the aerodynamics lecture? You will get to know by the end of this session. We will start this section with the game of racing. Usain Bolt's 100 meter time of 9.58 seconds during the 2009 World Championships in Berlin is the current world record and this makes him the fastest human on earth. Bolt's time of 9.58 seconds in Berlin was achieved by reaching a speed of 12.2 meters per second. Scientists with the help of a mathematical model discovered that less than 8% of the energy his muscles produced was used for motion and the rest was used to overcome the air resistance. If this is the situation of a sprinter running at the speed of 12.2 meters per second, imagine the case of a Formula 1 car moving at an average speed of 90 meters per second. It's very interesting to know how F1 Racing World handles this issue. But before that, we have to meet the ancestors of F1 cars. We will look at the history of Ferrari cars and their design evolution with time. Here you can see the design changes in each decade starting from 1950s till the present. The first major change in design came during the transition of front engine to rear engine configuration. Then at the end of 1960s, rear wings were introduced in cars and cars from 1970s had front wings too. We will see the significance of having these front and rear wings in a couple of minutes. The length of the car, that is, wheel to wheel distance also changed with each decade. What is the reason behind these design changes other than Formula 1 regulations? Let us analyze. The Formula 1 regulations specify that cars must be constructed by the racing teams themselves, though the design and manufacture can be outsourced. The design team, with the help of feedback from the racing team, comes up with the design to reduce their effort in fighting against the opposing air. At the end of every match, they analyze and then try to improve the design further. The interesting part is, that the design requirements depend on the racing track also. On straight tracks, like the one shown in the left side, the battle tends to be determined by the power of engine and brakes. But when it comes to tracks which has more sharp turns and corners, 
like the Singapore Marina Bay Street circuit, cars need more stability than power. The fundamental principle of efficient cornering is the traction between tyres and the road. Unlike commercial or passenger vehicles, racing cars have much more to take care than the fuel consumption. The exterior designer has two primary concerns. First, minimizing the air's resistance to move, which tends to slow down the car, and second, creation of downforce to help push the car's tires onto the track and improve cornering forces. This downforce is provided with the help of rear and front wings. When air flows over these wings, the shape of the wings creates uneven pressure on both sides of the wings. Orientation of the wings ensures lower pressure at bottom surface and higher pressure on the top surface. As this pressure tries to balance, the wing tries to move in the direction of the low pressure. This pushes the car onto the track. The front wings are located at the front of the cars. The most important function of the front wing is to generate downforce for steering. This also decides the path of air interaction with the body and rear wing. Front wing contributes 42% of the total downforce provided by the wings. Rear wing contributes about 58% of the total downforce provided by the wings. The rear wing and front wing allows different possible settings for angle of attack. Angle of attack is nothing but the angle with which the wing faces the wind. On tracks with many tight corners, the wings are set steep to provide more downforce. And on tracks with long straights, the wings are set flat to reduce traction and increase speed. Adjustable rear wings can be set to different orientation on the move. The video shows the wings are set steep while taking turn to provide more downforce near the corner. And then the wings are set back to flat position to increase speed in the straights. Failure of rear wings can cause serious damage. Many accidents have happened in past due to this. This video shows one such incident where the rear wing breaks off, creating a sudden loss in rear downforce near the turn and forcing the car into a spin. In the struggle to gain fraction of a second in racing, knowing the wind behavior around the car helps a lot. The teams invest up to 20% of their total budget in the science of wind to make their cars even faster. Helmets, whose primary function is providing safety to drivers, also contribute in resistance to motion. Proper designing of helmets can bring in considerable difference in reducing air resistance. Knowing the wind behavior around objects not only helps in sports vehicles but is also used to build sports equipment. Lot of efforts and time are also invested in studying the correct posture of bikers for racing against wind. This will help to avoid air resistance and achieve maximum possible speed. But the science of wind doesn't end with racing. When asked to find out each ball's corresponding sport, I am very sure everyone can answer. But the question here is whether the dimples, stitches and seams of the ball has effect on the game or is it just to decorate? In all the games shown here, the ball is made to fly through air. A ball in flight encounters gravity and air friction or air resistance. 
As soon as a ball is thrown, air works against the ball to slow it down. These stitches break up the airflow, which actually reduces the air resistance and enables the ball fly further than if it was smooth all the way around. Have a look at the baseball and its trajectory. In baseball, we have a pitcher who is throwing the ball and we have a hitter who hits the ball. If the pitcher throws the ball straight towards the strike zone, then the ball would experience only air friction and gravity. Based on this understanding, the expected ball path would vary only in the direction of gravity and in the direction of ball in which it was thrown. But actual ball trajectory shown here is far different from what we have anticipated. How did this happen? Is it because of the size of the ball or stitches on the surface of the ball? Or is it because of the way the pitcher throws the ball to the strike zone? To understand, let's look at the top view of the baseball ground. In actual case, while throwing the ball towards the hitter, the pitcher spins the ball in the direction shown here. And when the air flows around the spinning ball, air is forced to move faster on the right hand side of the ball compared to the other side of the ball. This results in uneven pressure on both sides of the ball's surface. The side with more velocity will have less pressure and the side with low velocity will have high pressure. This unbalanced pressure force pushes the ball from the high pressure side to the low pressure side. So, in this case, the ball moves away from the hitter. The strength of the push depends on the ball size, speed at which the ball is thrown, rotational speed at which the ball spins, and the stitches on the ball. This push towards one side is generated due to rotation and is called Magnus effect, which will be discussed in detail in the next lecture of this course. The impact of this Magnus force is much visible when the mass of the object is less or in other words, the inertia is less. This video shows the path of a blitz ball which is nothing but a backyard baseball toy that weighs very less than the original ball. Same Magnus effect is happening here too. This explains some unbelievable goals in the history of football. No offense guys, if you are a football fan. I agree, only physics is not sufficient. It comes with a lot of practice and a little understanding and applying wind signs. Now cricket is a different ball game. The surface roughness and the seam position does the trick for the bowlers here. If the ball is rough on the left side and shiny and smooth on the right side of the seam, then with this position or orientation of seam shown here, air will form a laminar boundary layer over the smooth side and separates early from the ball surface. But the airflow reaching the seam turns turbulent over the rough side and sticks to the surface longer. Due to this difference in separation point location on both sides, the wake region will form as shown here and this will cause the ball to swing out of a right hand batsman. In a similar fashion with a little thought, the direction of swing can be changed. Although the theory looks very simple, weather conditions and bowler's varying bowling speed makes it challenging to execute. I am aware that you might not be familiar with boundary layers, but don't worry types of boundary layer and its characteristics will be discussed in detail in the next lecture of this course. 
Let me show you some of my personal favorite wickets in which aerodynamics is beautifully used. Having discussed almost all the scenarios of wind motion around solids, it's time to discuss about aircrafts and their flight. I will not discuss too much on this topic as this will be covered in the third lecture of this course. Inspired by the natural aviators, it was at the beginning of 20th century that Wright brothers succeeded in flying the first aircraft and proved to mankind that yes, even we can fly. And now we have different modes of flying. Balloons, airplanes, helicopters, rockets, spaceships, unmanned air vehicles. Both principles of flight and the purpose of flight varies between each other. We will discuss on aircraft in this session. Any object needs an upward force to fly. For aircraft, it is wings that provide that upward force. The shape of the wing is a special shape called airfoil. When the wing moves through air, the air splits and flows above and below the wing. The design of airfoil is such that the air pressure above the wing decreases. This creates a pressure difference on both sides with higher pressure on the lower side. This provides a push force for the aircrafts to fly. For different configurations of airfoil or different angle of attack, that is, the angle at which the airfoil approaches the air, the strength of the upward force increases. The design of wings is critical to create more upward force without creating much of the air resistance. Wind tunnel tests of scale models under appropriate flight conditions and CFD simulations are carried out to predict the upward force and the air resistance. We are at the end of this lecture. Now, having spent enough time on looking at the real life scenarios where aerodynamics is applied, Let's check our understanding again. Again close your eyes for a moment and listen to this word now. Aerodynamics. I hope you are able to see some cars and train designs moving towards reduced energy consumption, increasing wind turbine sizes. Some of you are concerned about wind loading of your buildings and flats some about physics behind your favorite sports and some about flights flying. In that case, I have managed to convince your curious mind that aerodynamics has more than flight. Now, we are at a stage of formulating our understandings and give a definition for aerodynamics. Aerodynamics is the way air moves around things. 
It is the study of forces and the resulting motion of objects through the air. Thanks for listening. And if you have any feedback or queries, you can mail us at info at learncax.com. See you around for the next lecture.